Hey everyone, Thomas here. Welcome to the August edition of What's in the Sky, where we take a look at the best things to see overhead this month from right here in the Southern Hemisphere. With winter continuing, we're still getting long nights and steady skies, perfect conditions for observing. There aren't quite as many planets around this month, but that just means we've got more room to explore some incredible deep sky objects. So whether you're heading out with a telescope or just curious what's happening up there right now, here's what to look out for this August. And first up, we have Mars. If you've been watching these episodes over the past few months, you'll know Mars has been sinking lower each night. Now we're about to be seeing it nearly for the last time this year. It's still just visible in the northwest around 5.30 p.m. But this August and early September, it's your last solid chance to catch it before it disappears behind the sun until July next year. You won't see much detail, but if you've been tracking it this far, it's worth a final look before it's gone. Secondly, we have Saturn. Out of all the planets this month, Saturn easily takes the spotlight. It's now rising earlier and climbing higher, which makes it much easier to observe than it's been in recent months. And if you look back at it in July, you might notice a change. The rings have shifted slightly, appearing more closed in as they move closer to the edge on from our perspective. That classic open ring view is slowly fading, so now's the time to enjoy it while it lasts. You'll be able to spot Saturn from around 11 p.m., but it really shines around 2.30 in the morning, when it's high above the horizon. That height matters. When a planet is higher in the sky, you're looking through less of the Earth's atmosphere, which means sharper detail, better contrast, and steadier views through your telescope. If you've been waiting for a good time to go after Saturn, this might be it. Next up, we have Neptune. Neptune is up early in the morning again, just like last month, it's small and faint, but if you're already looking at Saturn, it's nearby and worth trying for. Neptune won't show more than a small blue dot, but it's a serious benchmark. Most people have never seen it, and now you have the chance. If you can see Saturn, then you'll be able to spot Neptune. But for the best observing, aim for 2.30 a.m. when it's also higher in the sky. Just like Saturn, the altitude makes a difference. And finally, we have the Moon. There are two great lunar targets this month. First is Clavius Crater on August 6th around 9 p.m. It is huge, one of the oldest craters we can see, and if you've got binoculars or a telescope, you'll spot smaller craters scattered across its floor. NASA also detected water molecules here, and for film buffs, this was the setting for the moon base in 2001, a space odyssey. Later in the month on August 29th around 6 p.m., take a look at the Posidinius Crater. It's a very different type of target. The floor is crisscrossed with ridges caused by old volcanic activity, which gives it a rough fractured appearance. If you're using a telescope, there's a lot to explore here, especially when the low lighting angle brings out the surface detail. Hey guys, Ash here, and with fewer planets to chase this month, August is a great time to slow things down and focus in on deep sky objects. The Milky Way is still running right across the night sky, and with crisp winter air and less atmospheric turbulence, it's the perfect backdrop for clusters, nebulae, and rich star fields, many of which that are only visible from the southern hemisphere. Up first, we've got a classic target, the Lagoon Nebula, also known as Messier 8. You might have seen it in the news recently, thanks to some jaw-dropping images from the Vera Rubin Observatory. But this is one you can actually observe for yourself, even with modest gear. From a dark site, it's one of the few star-forming nebulae visible to the naked eye. Through binoculars or a small telescope, it appears as a soft, glowing cloud. Look closer, and you'll notice a distinctive dark shape running through the brightest region of the nebulae. A UHC filter like this astronomic one will help cut through the light pollution and boost contrast, making this object stand out even more. Smart telescope users will get fantastic results quickly, and for astrophotographers, this is a go-to target. It's bright, detailed, and looks stunning with a wide-field low focal length setup. You'll find it in the constellation Sagittarius, near the heart of the Milky Way. It's visible from around 6 p.m., 
but aim to observe between 7.30 and 8.30 p.m. when it's highest in the sky, and if you can, save it for the end of the month when the moon's out of the way. Now, right next to the lagoon, you'll also find the Trifid Nebula, also known as Messier 20, another standout in this part of the sky. It's a bright, star-forming region that's especially interesting because it combines several different types of nebulae in one place. There's an emission, reflection, and dark nebula, and even an open cluster, all working together to create its distinctive shape. The name Trifid comes from the three dark dust lanes that cut across the nebula, dividing it into lobes. From a dark site with a decent scope, you'll be able to make out these features as fine streaks through the glow. What really sets this object apart is the contrast between the red hydrogen glow and the surrounding blue reflection nebula, which makes it a favorite for astrophotographers. Smart telescope users will get great results too, since the Trifid fits nicely in the field of view and reveals good structure with very little effort. It's also one of those objects that keeps improving with longer exposures. You'll find it just beside the lagoon in the constellation Sagittarius, and it's visible from 6 p.m., but aim to observe it around 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. when it's highest in the sky, and again, try to catch it later in the month once the moon has moved on. Following on from those two incredible nebulae, nearby and next up is Ptolemy's Cluster. This is one of the brightest open clusters in the sky and a fantastic visual target no matter what you're using. You can spot it with the naked eye from a dark site, and even from the city, it holds up well through binoculars or a small telescope. It sits just below the tail of Scorpius and stands out as a tight patch of stars, around 80 in total, packed into a relatively small area of sky. Through a telescope, you'll see it burst into a sparkling field of individual stars, and in darker skies, the surrounding Milky Way dust gives it some really beautiful context. Smart telescopes will frame it easily, but this one really shines through the eyepiece. It's also a decent wide-field astrophotography target, especially if you're capturing the nearby dark nebulae in the region. You'll find it near the tail of Scorpius, and while it'll be visible from 6 p.m. onwards, try viewing it between 8 and 9 p.m. And as always, aim for the end of the month when the moon is out of the way to see the most detail. And finally, Here's a reminder that Milky Way season is still going strong, so there's plenty of time to get out there and enjoy our local galaxy. While you're out there, don't miss one of the Milky Way's most spectacular features, the Sagittarius star cloud. Despite its name, it's not actually a cluster of stars. Instead, it's a bright opening in the Milky Way's dust lane, giving us a clear window right into the star-rich core of our galaxy. Visually, the Sagittarius star cloud is simply breathtaking. In dark skies, with a good pair of binoculars, it looks like a vast sea of stars stretching endlessly, with delicate dust filaments framing the view. The Milky Way rises right overhead between 7.30 and 9.30 p.m., and you'll see the large Sagittarius star cloud as a large, bright patch on the southern edge of the Milky Way. This month, we're adding something new a challenge target. It's for those of you looking to push your observing a little further, or if you're just after something different to hunt down. The Inkspot Nebula, also known as Bernard 86, is a great example of a dark nebula. It's not something you see glowing in the sky, instead, it's a pocket of cold gas and dust that blocks the light from the stars behind it. What makes it stand out is the contrast a dense black patch right in the middle of a rich star field. Dark skies are a must for this one. Dark nebulae are especially sensitive to light pollution. It's located in the constellation Sagittarius, sitting right next to the open cluster NGC 6520. From a dark site, the pair make for a striking combination. The ink spot itself is small, so we recommend using at least 60 times magnification and a telescope with 6 inches of aperture or more. Try to observe between 6.30 and 8.30 p.m. while it's still nice and high in the southwest. If you've been thinking about making a trip to darker skies, this one's a perfect excuse. 
That's it for this month's night sky guide. We hope it gives you some inspiration to get out there and observe. While the planets are taking a bit of a backseat this month, there's no shortage of incredible deep sky targets to explore, and there's still the Milky Way itself, of course. If you missed last month's video, we covered even more nebulae and clusters that are still reasonably well placed. You can check that out in the description below. And if you're looking to level up your observing or imaging, check us out online at bintel.com.au or using the link below. As always, we'd love to see what you're observing, so feel free to share your images or questions in the comments below. Clear skies, and we'll see you next month.